Welcome YouTube family. It's really good to be back with you and I have a teaching for tonight in answer to many questions about intimacy with the Lord and, and how the Lord has led me into that place with Him where I can actually hear Him and see Him and receive counsel and, and teaching from Him. First of all, I want to say that we have to want Him with all our hearts. That has to be our very top priority, is to have a really, truly deep love relationship with the Lord. As the scripture says, you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore. Uh, it's Jeremiah 29, 13. So this is an intimate love relationship. It must be nourished with quality time, sacrifice, and priority. No man wants to be last on a woman's to-do list. In fact, he doesn't want to be on any list. He wants our whole attention distracted by him when we aren't sensibly together. And this is a grace. All I have to do is ask for it, make time for it, and nourish and protect it when it's given. He doesn't want my leftovers. He wants my prime time. And when I begin to give him that, it's all I want as well. When I got my life in God order, I put him in the absolute center and I arranged all other activities around him. Church, videos, conferences, and all the things we can do that are considered strengthening had to take a back seat to that intimate time with him. I started getting less and less out of church and more and more out of my time with him. When we go to a conference, we can glean a few things that help us and perhaps get prayer. But when we go to the Lord personally, He addresses things directly. We don't have to wade through hours and hours of lectures. He addresses the important things directly and heals us on the spot. There's a huge difference there. Now, when I fail to show up for prayer or I cut it short, I feel like I've stood him up. And I know it hurts him because he knows that I love the things in my life more than I love him. Or I wouldn't have allowed that to happen. It hurts him to see me dedicating 16 hours of my day to work and the very last 45 minutes to him. But I'm dead dog tired nonetheless. I mean, that's just the worst thing to do. We wouldn't save that time for anyone we really cared about. That's time when you get ready for bed and go to sleep or you do the dishes or do something mindless. But it's certainly not time that we want to spend with the love of our life. When I finally got sick and tired of my merry-go-round life, I forcefully and deliberately put a stop to everything that was interfering with that time with him. <clears throat> Here are the things that have helped me immensely, and I have to say these are things the Holy Spirit has led me to practice in my life, and they've always brought me the comfort of his sensible presence. We can know that he's present in many different ways. We can sense his presence. But when I say sensible, I mean seeing him in the spirit and hearing him in the spirit and talking to him and getting an answer back. So there's a real dialogue going on. So the first thing you want to do is set the scene. Take control of your time and your space and make sure it's protected. This is the man you're marrying for all eternity. You're going to meet him and share feelings and plans. You're going to be strengthened and nourished in one another's company. Yes, you heard me right. 
you're going to be strengthened, both of you, and nourished in one another's company. But how do you nourish and strengthen the Lord of glory? That's a good question. Well, if you remember, the angels were sent to him in the garden to strengthen him for the ordeal of his passion. And he relives that passion every day, thousands of times, when he sees children murdered in their mother's womb, a man sleeping with another man's wife, a corporate executive making plans to spray aluminum in the skies that will poison the population, generals planning to use biological weapons of mass destruction. He writhes in pain over these crimes against mankind and his creation. He needs someone to respond to him, someone who cares, loves him, and has made him the absolute priority of their day in their lives. Yes, indeed, truly you strengthen him with your love. Out of this great sea of uncaring humanity, just one has risen to kiss his Lord with his life. How he longs for that. So set aside the time of day when you are freshest. That might mean going to bed at 9 p.m. and getting up in the still quiet hours of the morning when the rest of the world is still asleep. 5 a.m. is a very good time. 4.30 is even better. It depends on your family's work and school schedule. Plan on spending an hour and a half. That's a very nice portion of time. A lot can get done. Part of it's going to be in worship, part of it's going to be in repentance, and part in being instructed and healed by him and resting in him. For me, a good cup of coffee, a stimulant, is very, very important. It's just my metabolism. It needs a morning kick. And if you can be alert <clears throat> and really on your toes without it, great. So there are two different approaches that I have to entering this time. One is thanksgiving and worship, and the other is repentance and asking for God's grace to change me. And so we'll go into that one first. Over 30 years ago, when I'd just become a Christian, I took a class at a church based on the book, Lord, Change Me, by Evelyn Christensen. This set the stage and basis for my sanctification. In this book, she taught me how to listen for the anointing on a passage of Scripture with an ear to changing things in my life that didn't please our Savior. In other words, the Holy Spirit would quicken something, and I would know that it was from God and it was something I needed to pay attention to. I highly recommend this book, by the way, and it is available through Amazon. But basically, the technique is very simple. You choose a chapter in the Bible, pick it up every day, and read it until you feel a quickening in your spirit, like a little spotlight going off on one line or one word. It's called a rhema. That is, an anointed word just for you. The Lord will meet you more than halfway to cultivate a listening heart as you begin this journey, by the way. In this way, the Holy Spirit directs us to the things that are timely and necessary for us. When we choose our own Bible study, we tend to go for what we like or what interests us. Sometimes we can be led by the Spirit, but I prefer a more reliable way, where I know the Holy Spirit's in charge. You can choose a chapter or you can ask for fresh manna from heaven. Lord, please lead me. What would you have me read today? Then with good faith, believing God will answer that prayer, open your Bible and begin to read until the Lord quickens something to you. Yes, I know there are many people out there who would ridicule this method, but remember we are kings and priests and anointed to hear the voice of God. Drawing lots was a similar method that was used in the scripture to find things out. Uh, they gave God the space to make the decision and to speak. It's been used for a long time in the scriptures. 
used when choosing the replacement for Judas. They drew lots and finding Jonah as the reason the ship was going down. And it works. Let the scoffers laugh all they want. But the Lord said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 18, 3. At the point the Holy Spirit quickens a line of scripture, stop. Ponder what he's saying. Lock it away in your heart. Go over it and over it in your mind and look at all the different ways that it applies to you. Then rest in that word. Tuck it away. But keep it in mind because something's going to come up that day that involves that very word. It may be a confirmation of what you were thinking about. It may be a warning not to fall into temptation because the enemy set a trap for you. Or it may be a word of love that will reach down deeply and even bring you to, even bring you to tears. He especially does this with me when I'm under conviction and almost afraid to go to him. He sends me a heart in my coffee or jam, or a heart-shaped rock, or a cloud. Oh, there's so many different love letters he scatters throughout our days. If only we'll stop, look, and listen, and pay very close attention with the expectation that he's speaking to us all day long, and he's looking for us to acknowledge that. And if we, if we look, we'll see that he never ceases to encourage us and to remind us that he's walking with us through our day. One book I love to use as a surgeon uses a scalpel is The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Rarely does this book fail to speak to my heart. I go to this book when I want to know, Lord, where am I at with you? What's going on? Am I, am I pleasing to you? Or are there some things that you really would love for me to look at? Once I'm convicted of something, it's all I can do to ask forgiveness and repent deeply, acknowledging my fault and asking for the grace to overcome it. He is so taken with the soul who is contrite. The scriptures even say, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. That's Psalm 51, 15. Just as we rush to forgive our children when they confess a fault with true contrition, so the Lord rushes to comfort and sustain us. Now we're ready to receive the graces necessary to change our ways. Very often this process brings me right into the very sensible presence of Jesus, seeing, feeling, hearing him, just as he promised us. In Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. In John 14, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And that's what this was really all about. It's purifying our hearts so that we can see him. And the purer our hearts and our motives become, the clearer will be the vision of his face. You may find that journaling will bring you into that sensible presence. As you write your thoughts and prayers, asking for forgiveness, he may quicken a scripture verse to you or even begin to speak to your heart. Don't be afraid to go with what you hear and write down. That's how I began this journey, and many others have begun successfully the very same way. The Lord is profoundly grateful for the soul who is continually submitting to the scalpel of righteousness with the sincere desire to be formed and pleasing to Him. So many are oblivious to the heart of God, so many ignore Jesus. When he finds just one that truly cares, 
He's eternally grateful and showers that soul with marks of affection. We can't accomplish this alone. Sooner or later, we must let him carry us. All he wants is our consent and sincere efforts to cooperate with him. When we've been dodging certain things in our lives, you know how that feels, (laughs) and we know we need to change something, using the scalpel, that is the imitation of Christ, is very comforting because it really highlights the very thing that God wants to address. He'll never bring something up that you can't handle. The grace will always be there or he wouldn't bring it up. Not only that, but things must be addressed in a certain order. If we try to do the sanctifying ourselves by tackling what we think needs changing, look out. When the Lord Jesus leads us in changing things, they get changed. Far less painfully, I might add. He's completely aware of what needs to go first. And when we turn ourselves over to his leadership, he accomplishes wonders. So this is one method he has led me to use. The other is to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and praise. There are many fine anointed musicians to draw from. Playing this music, even with headphones and worshiping, is very effective. He loves our worship. I recount all the good things he has done for me and worship with the music. And there comes a time. For those of you who are athletes, it's like runner's high, (laughs) except it's God's high. You can continue to worship, or if led to do so, stop and enter into that quiet place and rest in the glory of God. He may approach you, hold you, kiss your forehead, dance with you, sit with you, and want to talk. Oh, he's so approachable and human in his ways of being with us. I'll tell you right now, he loves to dance. He loves to hold his bride, and he will even transform her. You'll see yourself wearing a wedding dress or an evening gown and your hair done up. And there have been times when the color of my dress... uh, When I see my dress, the color of it reflects what kind of thing is happening in my life. If it's a trial, it's purple. Uh, If it's a celebration, it's peach. If it's uh, bridal, it's white. And he's amazing that way, how he communicates with colors. Yes, he loves to shower gifts on his bride. And for men, it's not effeminate to see yourself as a bride with the Lord. This is truly your identity. God is the creator. We are the receivers. And that is a feminine aspect, but not in the sense of sinful or sexual at all. It's a mystery, guys. Leave a tender moment alone, okay? My husband is anything but effeminate. He spent his younger days hunting and fishing on the bayou in Louisiana, and he's very masculine, but he has seen himself in the spirit, as the bride of Christ. In fact, we've, um, in Chronicles of the Bride, the book that's on our website, heartdwellers.org, you can read about his experiences. They're pretty amazing. So this kind of intimacy usually begins through the eye of the imagination, or at least that's our take on it. I mean, that's what we're thinking. Oh, this is my imagination. But in reality, it is going on. And what you think you are imagining most often is the Lord taking you by the hand and drawing you into his reality. Go with it. Would he give you a snake if you asked for a fish? He is protecting that time and keeping the familiar spirits out of it. In another video, I'll get into that. But for now, as you begin this kind of relationship with the Lord, he will protect the time. Being close to him in this way is so healing. He knows your pain. You're absolutely an open book to him. And he wants to comfort you. Let him. When you walk out of this kind of prayer, you're equipped to be his ambassador of love and comfort others. You know, you just can't give what you don't have. And this is preeminently 
the time set aside for your healing and equipping. As time goes by, you'll begin to gain confidence that Jesus is truly with you. He is real. This is not a phantom or familiar spirit. This is God. At the same time, he will draw attention to the necessity of humility. Those who are gifted with this kind of relationship will be broken many, many, many times in order to safeguard their gift. Pride enters in so easily. Don't be afraid. It gets better and better and better. Don't even be afraid to go with him when you've really blown it. This is a little secret. When I've really blown it, it was because he withdrew grace and let me fall. Why? I was getting proud, self-satisfied, and even reading my own press. And because he loves me, he withdrew my strength and let me fall flat on my face. Now he's waiting for me to come to him for healing. I might be running around the house nesting like women do when they're upset or insecure. But he's so sweet and so faithful and so gentle and honest. Eventually, he draws me back in so I can come and confess my fault. I love that song by Carrie Job, You Were For Me. That's the title of the song. In it, she says, I know that you were for me, and I know you will not forsake me in my weaknesses. Oh, that's so true. Okay, speaking of Carrie from Gateway Worship, I have found some musicians in whom I recognize an extraordinary anointing. Carrie Job is one. Terry McAlman is another. Jessica Kitola, Charlotte Laystrom, and Christ for the Nations. Blessed Hope Chapel and Hillsong Music. And here are some very powerful transforming songs by Carrie. My Beloved, Revelation Song, Beautiful, The More I Seek You, uh, Here in Your Presence by Jessica Kitola, It's All About You by Charlotte Laystrom, and Terry McAlman. He has a lot of songs. I Came to Worship You, Oh the Glory of Your Presence, I Will Never Let Go, Agnes Day, Even So, How Long, and Christ for the Nations, All of Me. One more artist worthy of mention is John Michael Talbot. He has an album called For the Bride that is very deep and very beautiful, based on the Song of Songs. And we have um, also have a Song of Songs album on our website that's a free download. It's only 20 minutes long, but it's very sweet. Anyway, don't worry about writing all these down because I'm going to make a PDF of this message and put it on our website on the teaching page. So you can go ahead and pick up this list from them. And these songs are just suggestions, but I must say this is not about taste in music. It's about anointing, the anointing to bring you into the Holy of Holies. These musicians sing to Jesus they are obviously very intimate with him, or they couldn't bring you into his presence. Songs about Jesus are nice for listening to, but when you want to connect with him, in my experience, there's no better way than <clears throat> either to start out with deep repentance or intimate worship. And on that note, I never use these anointed songs for background music or casual listening. They're sacred to me, and I use them just for our very own intimate times together. Well, I'm going to close for now. I think that's a lot to chew on. I hope that helps um, all of you who have been writing to me and asking for direction in this. Um, I know some of you have already been in this place with the Lord for many years. But I'm addressing this to those who really want to go deeper and enter into a real, sensible relationship with Jesus. And don't be surprised if God the Father and the Holy Spirit show up too. The three are one. And just one last thing I want to say. Um, 
some people think that you can't see or hear from God, but that's contrary to the scriptures. The Lord has made those promises in many places. I just quoted three for you, but there's so many more places where he's promised that intimate relationship with us. And every time you pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guys, in heaven you are going to see and hear and speak to Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. There's going to be no separation any longer. The veil will be removed. So remember that as the enemy tries to hit you with skepticism, um, scoffing, or unbelief. This is scriptural, and it's promised to us now, here and now, and it's necessary for us. That's why Satan hates it so much. It's absolutely necessary for us to be able to minister the love of God to other people, for us to enter into this and to overcome our faults as well. God bless you and hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much for listening.